The following message is made available by Truth For Life. For more information, visit us online at truthforlife.org. Now, our subject for this hour, um, uh, Alistair is to blame. He asked me to do this, and uh, it was along the lines of, please explain what on earth you do in your study that ends up with, yeah, the kind of thing we've been hearing. (laughs) We're going to talk about preaching from the Old Testament, particularly preaching from Old Testament narratives. And uh, if you were here for something else, you can leave during the prayer. (laughs) Let's pray together. Our God and Heavenly Father, the task before us is a big one, a challenging one, but a wonderful one. And we pray that you would fill us with joy in studying your word, in discovering its riches. Fill us with joy in the wonderful task of sharing those riches with the people of God and sharing them too with those who do not yet know the Saviour. We pray, Heavenly Fathers, we just put our mind now to the practicalities of how do we do this, how do we prepare to do it. We pray that you'd help us to and particularly help me to cover things that will be helpful. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, friends, I'd like to approach this um, by looking at four basic questions to fit in with the theme of our conference, four basic questions, uh, the fourth of which will take about half of our time. So the first three are sort of preliminary. I think they're very important questions. Uh, Yes, they're basic. Um, but I hope that they will clear the air for us. And in the, it, it, when we get to the fourth question, we will, uh, that will be our main topic. So um, let me start with question one. What are we trying to do? Now, that's a question that is answered uh, in various ways through this conference. We will be, we've, we, we've heard already a number of uh, things said, and we will hear more. But uh, it's a question to which I hope we can constantly return. What are we trying to do as we preach. I remember asking a a young preacher once, what were you trying to do as you preached this morning? (laughs) Ah, no, it was a kind question. His answer, which was not a bad answer, was I was trying to faithfully teach the Bible. But that's not quite what I was asking. What I was asking was, what was your faithful teaching of the Bible intended to do? And let me suggest an answer to that question. I'm not suggesting it's the only answer. I'm not suggesting it's a complete answer. But for me, it's a helpful answer. Here it is. We're going to, we're going to keep coming back to this. The proper purpose of all Christian preaching is to so proclaim Christ that, by God's grace, our hearers will be profoundly affected. That last bit is is, is very inadequate, but that's the best I could come up with. The proper purpose of all Christian preaching is to so proclaim Christ that by God's grace, our hearers will be profoundly affected. Now, we learn this from Paul in Colossians 1 and 2, and I understand Tony will be unpacking this this evening and correcting everything I get wrong. But in Colossians chapter 1 and 2, you, you know it well. Um, I, I, I think Alistair looked at this, uh, this passage at the last Basics Conference, whenever that was, years and years and years ago. But you know the words well. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, yeah. But what are you trying to achieve, Paul, with your proclamation of Christ, your warning, your teaching and the wisdom of it all? Well, that we may present everyone mature or complete or even perfect in Christ. Wow. What a goal. That we may present every one of our hearers mature in Christ. No wonder he goes on to say at uh, Colossians 1 verse 29, for this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. But again, what is it 
that you are struggling for? What are you struggling to see happen, Paul? Colossians 2, verse 2, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This is an astonishing statement of the goal of the apostles' labours. He proclaims Christ, but he doesn't simply proclaim... The proclaiming Christ, if I can put it like this, and I don't think... I'm sure this could be... This could be challenged. This isn't in my notes. This is not an end in itself. So we don't proclaim Christ in order to proclaim Christ. We proclaim Christ in order that by great God's grace all this might happen. Now, you might rightly point out that this great work is not to be limited to the preparing and preaching of sermons, and I think that's a fair point, and it would be an interesting and, I think, useful for us to reflect on how other aspect of a Christian, aspects of a Christian minister's work is striving towards the same goal. But I cannot think of a better statement of the purpose of Christian preaching than Colossians chapters 1 and 2. Christian preachers do not have the liberty to adopt some other goal for their labours in study, in preparation, in prayer, and in preaching. And as I reflect on my own preaching and what my own preaching does, here is the searching question. Is my preaching, by God's kindness, doing what Paul describes in Colossians chapters 1 and 2, at least in some measure? The proper purpose of all Christian preaching is so to so proclaim Christ that by God's grace our hearers will be profoundly affected. And I do want to dwell on this for a moment, friends, and uh, yes, I know it's basic, but it seems to me that we need to feel the weight of this if we are to be kept on course when we turn to the subject of preaching from an Old Testament narrative. Um, we could turn to a number of parts of the New Testament to see this. I, I just take you to... I, I love the description that Paul gives of the aim of sound teaching in, uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Uh, you, you may remember this, where, where Paul is charging Timothy to give himself to the healthy, wholesome teaching in the Ephesus church and to put a stop to different teaching. And he says, the aim of our charge, this is what sound teaching is meant to do, is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Now, it seems to me that's Colossians chapters 1 and 2 in different words, uh, less words as well. Is this, by God's mercy, what my sermon accomplished in those who listened? Genuine faith in Christ. Was that stirred? Good consciences, consciences that are sensitive, but nevertheless untroubled. That'd be something, wouldn't it? Purified hearts. That would be something. And all that issuing in love for others. The proper purpose of all Christian preaching is to so proclaim Christ that by God's grace, our hearers will be profoundly affected. So, question two, what's the problem? I'm at my desk um, early Tuesday morning to begin my prep. I open my Bible to the particular Old Testament narrative that is the text for next Sunday's sermon. 2 Kings chapter 1. Now, after I get over wondering who on earth was responsible for choosing this text <laughs> and what were they thinking, I think it was Alistair Begg who gave it to me, that's right. And why me? My problem is this. What is my sermon supposed to do with this Old Testament narrative? <laughs> 
especially if I have echoing in the back of my mind, as I hope I do, that the proper purpose of all Christian preaching is to so proclaim Christ that by God's grace, our hearers will be profoundly affected. Two kings, one, I say to myself. You see, the problem is that it is not immediately obvious how the purpose of any particular Old Testament narrative lines up with the purpose of Christian preaching. Because, of course, Old Testament narratives have a purpose. And as far as I can tell, that it is never simply for the record. And a key question as you study any of these stories of the Old Testament scriptures is what is it being told for? What is this, what is this story doing here? Why is it told? Why is it told here? Why is it told in this way? What is the intended impact of any particular Old Testament story? And the answer to that question, in my experience, is rarely simple and it is never trivial. But it's very often difficult for us to bring together the purpose we discern in the Old Testament narrative before us and the purpose of our preaching, which we understand very clearly, I hope. Now that's why it seems to me we often end up with sermons have you preached sermons like this? I certainly have. That appear to stick to the Old Testament text in question. You work through the text carefully, but actually fail to do what a sermon should do. Or sermons that appear to do what a sermon should do, but sit rather loose to the Old Testament text under consideration. I think I've done those ones too. But I want to suggest that no preacher should be content with either of those outcomes. I do not want to overstate this, and this is not time for a guilt trip, but the first is a failure of faithfulness as a preacher. You might have your Bible open in front of you, you might, but if you have not done what a sermon is meant, if you are not done in your sermon what a sermon is meant to do, by all means go back and challenge what I've, what I've suggested is the purpose of a sermon, but is that, if that's right and you're not doing it, you're not doing your job. The second one is a failure, as in a failure of integrity as a teacher of the Bible. Now, again, I don't want to overstate this. Um, I, can only, <laughs> I can only do this work because I am convinced that the Lord uses failures. Uh, that's good, isn't it? But that, should, that, that, that truth should be a comfort to us, but it ought not to be an excuse. And sometimes I think I've tried to avoid those two pitfalls that I've mentioned by preaching a, a sort of two-part sermon where I work through the narrative as carefully as I can so I clear my conscience about treating the Bible faithfully and then I stop, pause and have a few minutes at the end uh, hardly related to the previous exposition where I try to do what a sermon should do. Have you done that? I've done that. I've done all of those things. But I want to do better than that. Because the tension that I'm trying to describe, and it's a real tension, the problem that leads us to preach those awkward sorts of sermons, it's got to be an artificial tension, doesn't it? It can't be real. I mean, I've just said it's real, but it, 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 it's real in our experience, but it can't be a reality out there. It's got to be, it's got to be the result of some misunderstanding. There cannot, in fact, be a tension between the purpose of our preaching and the purpose of the Scriptures can't be attention. And I believe that to be precisely the case. But sitting at my desk on Tuesday morning with 2 Kings chapter 1 before me, it's not necessarily obvious. And my simple point that I really want us to take seriously is that I should not be satisfied until I have a clear understanding of what this sermon is aiming to do that gels with a clear understanding of the intended impact of our Old Testament narrative. So that the impact of the sermon is the impact of the story. The power of the story is the power of the sermon. And that I want to suggest is what preaching from an Old Testament narrative should be aiming for. Okay, question three. <clears throat> 
can't we simply avoid the problem? See, the question is this, and I, I, I do think that many of us get to this. It, it, yeah. Uh, if our purpose as we preach is to so preach Christ that our hearers will be affected in those deep ways that we've been thinking about, why would we need to preach from the Old Testament at all? Really? I mean, isn't there more than enough for a lifetime of preaching in the pages of the New Testament? Isn't Christ most clearly presented on every page of the New Testament? Is it necessary to preach from the Old Testament at all? I want to face that question because I think it is a question that is, that is answered uh, in the negative uh, without a lot of reflection quite often. It's a good question. Is it necessary for us to preach from the Old Testament at all? Of course, many don't. I won't ask for a show of hands. But ever since, ever since the second century heretic Marcion, there have been those who either, as he did, demanded that the Old Testament scriptures be explicitly excluded from the Christian canon, you don't hear that much these days, or simply relegated to a place of neglect, which in practice, of course, amounts to much the same thing. And I have a sneaking suspicion that this sort of semi-Marcionite tendency lies behind the neg neglect of the Old Testament in some of our churches and from some of our pulpits. And I want to... <laughs> Um, I'll indulge in a little bit of Scottish overstatement here. At the, at the risk of that kind of overstatement, <laughs> over-dramatising the situation, it seems to me that to the extent that that is so, to the extent that that is so, there is a big problem. At this point, as seriously as many, as many others in our day, authentic Christianity is at risk. Because a Christianity that is not consciously, explicitly founded and based and grounded in the Old Testament scriptures is not the Christianity of the New Testament. If we do not preach from the Old Testament, we are not proclaiming Christ as the New Testament proclaims Christ. Let me put that rather boldly. If we are not preaching from the Old Testament, it's difficult to see how we're preaching the same Christ as the New Testament for the very simple reason that the New Testament preaches Christ from the Old Testament. Christ is what the Old Testament is about, according to the New Testament. We need the Old Testament in order to know Christ, according to the New Testament. Am I overstating this? I don't think so. All right, you can come and tell me later on. I'm sure you will. But look with me, look with me at a, a, for example, at the well-known words. Come with me to Romans 15. You know these words well. Romans 15, verse 13. Let's go there. For just a moment. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope writes Paul, fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. What a wonderful prayer. It's a prayer, if you think about it, it's a prayer for the kind of maturity in Christ that we saw in Colossians 1, is it not? As the goal of Paul's labours or, or, or that verse in, in 1 Timothy 1 as the aim of sound teaching. Here in Romans 15, Paul is praying that the God of hope will fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. But here's the question. How do you think that the apostle expects that the God of hope will fill you with all joy and peace in believing? How, how's that going to happen? How will the power of the Holy Spirit cause you to abound in hope? Is it a kind of mystical thing? Paul prays this will happen. You close your eyes and it might happen. I don't think so. Have a look at it. Verse 13 comes as the conclusion to citations from Isaiah 11 in verse 12, Psalm 117 in verse 11, Deuteronomy 32 in verse 10, and Psalm 18 in verse 9. 
And here's my suggestion. It is by these Old Testament scriptures that Paul prays in verse 13 that God will fill you Christian believers with joy, peace, faith and hope. And that's precisely what he says back in verse 4 as we read this passage backwards. It's much better to read them forwards, but we'll do this. Back in verse 4. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of those scriptures, we might have hope. Hope. Christian hope comes, according to Romans chapter 15, through endurance, the experience of life, and the encouragement of the Old Testament scriptures. Now, how many Christians today have the experience of hope in that way? And if the answer is not many, do you see that's quite serious? It means that the normal Christian experience for which Paul prayed in those well-known words in Romans chapter 15, verse 13, is rare. Could that have something to do with the neglect of the Old Testament by us, us preachers? Now, don't misunderstand me. Of course, I am not denying that God works this wonder through the New Testament scriptures. Of course he does. The point I'm simply making is that the New Testament scriptures do not and were never meant to stand alone. No, no New Testament writer ever dreamt of proclaiming Christ without doing so from the Old Testament. Therefore, to proclaim Christ from the New Testament, we must do so from the Old Testament because that is what the New Testament does. In other words, what the New, according to the New Testament, what the Old Testament is for is precisely what Christian preaching is for. And that brings us to our main question. About time too. Question four. I'm going to put it like this. How do we find the road to Christ in an Old Testament narrative? Now, I'm sure you've heard, uh, or many of you have heard, the uh, familiar with probably with the uh, the Spurgeon story, um, the story that Spurgeon told. Uh, but it's so good, I can't resist telling it again. Uh, it goes like this: uh, uh, You can imagine the situation. Perhaps a young preacher having preached in the presence of a respected older minister, asked the older man for his evaluation of the message. Careful what you ask for. The younger man was perplexed to hear it judged a very poor sermon. His lack, the older man explained, was not in the choice of text or in his use of argument and illustration, but in the, fa in the fact that there was no Christ in it. When the younger man defended himself, as younger men tend to do, by, contend by contending Christ was not in the text, we're not to be preaching Christ always, we must preach what is in the text. His mentor replied, and this is what I love, don't you know, young man, some of you can recite it with me, I think, don't you know, young man, that from every town and every village and every hamlet in England, wherever it may be, there is a road to London. Oh, yes, says the young man. Ah, said the elder. And so from every text in Scripture, there is a road to the metropolis of the Scriptures, that is Christ. And my dear brother, your business is when you get to a text to say, now what is the road to Christ? And then preach a sermon running along that road towards the great metropolis, Christ. And said he, I have never yet found a text that had not got a road to Christ in it. And if I ever do find one that has not got a road to Christ in it, I'll make one. I will go over hedge and ditch, but I would get to my master for a sermon cannot do any good unless there be the savour of Christ in it. See, well, I had to go back to that story. It, it, isn't, isn't, that, isn't that wonderful? But the question I now want to uh, try to explore with you ever so inadequately, I'm afraid, but is how we discover the road to Christ that is in the text of an Old Testament narrative, uh, and I'm hoping we can do that so we won't have to make one. Now, it's true, uh, just a little beginning disclaimer, it's true that any one sermon, 
can only be expected to contribute in a measure to the goal of preaching. Not every sermon isn't expected to do everything. Likewise, no single Old Testament story is expected to do everything. But we are not at liberty to drift from the goal of presenting every one of our, mature, every one of our hearers mature in Christ. So I'm still at my desk on Tuesday morning. 2 Kings chapter 1 is open before me. I'm on to the second cup of coffee. How do you find, or how do you go about finding the road to Christ? And I want to suggest four steps. They're steps that I find essential and fruitful. Um, the steps are not complicated, and though I'm describing them step by step, they're not, they're not as, as clearly defined as that. You, you're sometimes thinking, and you're thinking of various steps, but I'm just teasing this out in, in, in this particular form for clarity, four steps. They do take some time. They do take some concentration and effort, and uh, here I can only provide a brief sketch of each and perhaps point you in the direction of further reflection. Step number one. This is where I would start. Pay attention to the details of this particular narrative text. That's where we start. Pay attention to the details of this particular narrative text. Now, that may sound obvious, and I suppose it is, but I do want to discourage the taking of shortcuts to get to the road to Christ. I have consistently found that time and effort spent grasping the particular details of the particular text pays rich dividends. Uh, give what time you can to this. How do you do that? How do you study a narrative? Uh, what, what, what details do you look at? What details are significant? Now, that's quite a big subject, and it's worth exploring further, and there are plenty of... Um, helpful books about the subject, about narratives and how you study narratives. Um, but let me just briefly outline the kind of thing that, uh, you can, that, that I, I believe is worth exploring. In a narrative, characters are important. Who are the characters? I often begin my study by just making a list of all the characters. What do we know about them? What baggage do they bring into this particular episode? And then places are important. Where does the action take place? What do we know about those places? What memories and associations do those places carry? Then thirdly, the movement of time in the story is part of the drama, uh, quite often quite strikingly in biblical narratives. And then these things, characters, places, times, are brought together in a plot. The story itself moves from its beginning to its end. How does it begin? How does it end? How did it get there? Now, those are the kind of questions I'll bring to 2 Kings chapter 1 on Tuesday morning. This is the, the kind of questions I'll start off with. And so I look at the characters. Who did we meet uh, last night? Uh, there was Ahaziah in verse 2 of 2 Kings 1. Uh, you, you may have it. You may find it helpful to have this. We're not going to do the detail. We're just illustrating here. And what do we know about Ahaziah, I'll ask? Uh, then, then immediately in verse 3 comes Elijah. Oh, that's, yeah, that's a familiar name, but what do we know about Elijah? Then uh, the third character I found uh, still in verse 2 was Baal, of course. Um, now, I'll, I'll be using a Bible dictionary at this point. That's a, that's a useful shortcut to uh, find material summarised, a good Bible dictionary uh, on each of the characters, uh, certainly each of the main characters. What, what do we know about the characters? Just do that work. Don't be, don't be impatient to get some, somewhere else. What do we know about the characters and the places? Well, the action in 2 Kings 1, as we saw last night, uh, takes place in Samaria in verse 2, uh, and in my opinion, on Mount Carmel. Now, those are significant places. All sorts of associations uh, with those places. You follow that up. Ekron was another place. That's got a bit of a backstory, a bit of a humorous one, really. And again, I go to my Bible dictionary. Uh, I might go to my Bible atlas, although I think the Bible dictionary is, is generally uh, more useful. Uh, it's, it, it's the role of these places and these characters in the story um, uh, more than the physical locations most of the time. Time, 
Uh, as I looked at 2 Kings 1, um, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, Old Testament stories aren't all that straightforward. The time just moves fairly smoothly forward, except perhaps that the Lord seems to send his messenger to Elijah in verse 3 at about the same time as Ahaziah sends his messengers to Ek- Ekron. So we're just starting to get into the story in this way. The plot? Well, the plot moves from Ahaziah's accident in verse 2, you remember, to his death in verse 17. And it's the story of the failure of his attempt to avert his death by appealing to Baal, which actually became the real reason for his death, according to the word of Elijah. And sooner or later, it will dawn on me that the course of events is driven in this narrative by the question that we hear three times through the narrative. Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending to inquire of Baal, the pest? That's got to be important, hasn't it? That question coming three times. That's the kind of work I'm doing at step one, Um, paying attention to the details of this particular text. Um, There'll be more in any particular narrative text to, to think about and to notice carefully as you work through it carefully, just looking at the details Now, of course, the sermon is not going to try and include all the details, but I do believe that the sermon will be enriched by the attention you're able to pay to those kinds of things, to the details of the narrative. However, the details in 2 Kings 1, they have not yet made clear a road to Christ, have they? So step two, consider carefully the context of the narrative. Step two, consider carefully the context of the narrative. Now, that's obviously an important principle. We don't always uh, give it the importance that that it has, but we're all familiar with the principle of context as the proper control for understanding any piece of language, actually. Uh, uh, That's how language works. It's how the brilliant thing, you can say an infinite number of things with a finite vocabulary and grammar. Why? Because context can, it, 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 because of the role of context. A word, a sentence, a paragraph, a story taken out of context can be misunderstood, can be given different meanings. The context illuminates and shapes the meaning and significance of a text. So uh, we've got this uh, 2 Kings chapter 1 in front of us. Where are we in the bigger story that is told by the books of Kings? And I sit back in my chair and flip through the books of Kings and try and get a, get a picture of where we are. The glory of Solomon's kingdom is a dis- distant memory. The two rival kingdoms, north and south, Israel and Judah, Samaria and Jerusalem, they've been limping along. I work it out for about 70 years now. Um, 1 Kings 22, just before we get to 2 Kings, told us of the death of Israel's worst king so far, Ahab. And his son Ahaziah comes to the throne and proves to be no better. And I I must take note of the last verse of 1 Kings, which sums this up. Uh, 1 Kings 22, verse 53, Ahaziah served Baal and worshipped him and provoked the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger in every way that his father had done. So 2 Kings begins under the dark cloud of God's wrath. That's got to be important. It took me a while, actually, as I was working on this. I can't believe how long it took. But eventually I came to notice the obvious fact that the great showdown on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18 was relatively recent. And if you think about it, it's more than probable that Ahaziah was there. Certainly he would have heard about it. It's the kind of event you don't forget easily. And then I began to notice resonances between 1 Kings 18 and 2 Kings chapter 1. Elijah's prayer on Mount Carmel had been, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel. And of course, on that day on Mount Carmel, it was known. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And that brings that repeated question in 1 Kings 2 to life, don't you think? Is it because there is no God in Israel that you're sending to inquire of Baal Zebub? Really, Ahaziah? Would you like to explain for a moment how you came to that conclusion? Can't you remember? You see how the context is illuminating the narrative. It is a great help if 
the preaching is working consecutively through the books. This is just, way, just way, another one of the benefits of that kind of preaching where we take books and work our way right through. It's not the only way of preaching. Uh, it's my favourite way of preaching. That doesn't make it the best way of preaching, but to, to preach right through the books. Because if you were doing that, if you were working consecutively through uh, 1 Kings and then coming into 2 Kings, just a few weeks ago, uh, well, you get to 2 Kings chapter 1, and just a few weeks ago, we were on Mount Carmel. And we can't forget the story uh, and, and, and so on. But where's the road to Christ? Step three. Now, think carefully about the story in the light of the whole story that the Bible tells. The older man in Spurgeon's story is absolutely right. There is always a road to Christ in an Old Testament narrative, an Old Testament text for that matter, but we're thinking about narratives, in an Old Testament narrative, because every Old Testament story is part of the big story that the Bible tells. And the big story is all moving towards Jesus Christ, through whom God's purposes for everything are fulfilled. I read somewhere, I can't remember where, um, that uh, somebody's saying that there are lots of stories in the Bible because God is, uh, sorry, lots of stories in the Bible because we love stories and God is a great communicator. He knows this, so he's given us a book with lots of stories in it. That really misses the point. The Bible contains lots of stories because the Bible is a story. It's the story. It's the true story that makes sense of life, the world, and everything. The story begins with the creation of all things. In the beginning, God created everything and ends with the, with, with, with the new heavens and the new earth where God's purposes from the beginning are fully realised. And how everything gets from there to there, that's the story the Bible tells. And at the heart of it all, is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Saviour of the world. Well, now we need to think about how our little story about Ahaziah falling off the roof is an episode in that story. And so we make the observation that the Old Testament, where we find this story, the Old Testament is the story of God's promise his commitment to his good purpose for all things. The promise, you remember, was first made to Abraham, Genesis 12, and the subsequent story through from there to the end of two kings tells how in faithfulness to his promise, God made the descendants of Abraham into a great nation. He blessed them, and in some small but striking ways, they were a blessing. In other words, the purpose of God for all things was being worked out on a small scale in the history of Israel. At the same time, the unfaithfulness of Israel emerged again and again and again through this story, forfeiting the blessing, choosing death, not life. What humanity did from the beginning, Israel did. And yet, as the prophets kept insisting, God's promise stands. Israel may be unfaithful, humanity may be unfaithful, but God is faithful. And the New Testament then tells the story of the fulfilment of God's promise. Not now for Israel only, but for the whole world, the whole of creation in such a way that no human failure will destroy. So Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. What's the significance of the story of Ahaziah in 2 Kings chapter 1 in the light of the whole story? Two kings, uh, we thought about this last night, is the story of Israel in deep trouble because of their rebellion against God. 
But is it not clear in the light of the whole story that Israel's troubles profoundly correspond to the deep trouble of the world because of the world's rebellion against God? And so I found myself reading two kings alongside Romans chapter 1. And as I hear the the stark little story of King Ahaziah and his foolishness and his wickedness, it's not arbitrary, is it, to see the world in precisely the same trouble? Is it because there is no God in Israel, Ahaziah? Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for something else. Therefore, God gave them up. Now, have we found the road to Christ? I believe we have. It runs via Romans 1. The dark truth about our troubled world. Which is fundamental to the gospel we must proclaim. Reflected in 2 Kings and laid bare in Romans 1. Helps us to see the absolute brilliance of Jesus Christ. But now... In Jesus Christ, but only in him, light shines into the darkness. Despite everything, God is faithful. And in Jesus Christ has opened the way to forgiveness and goodness and truth and life. Now, friends, my very brief description of step three is my attempt to sort of summarise what I've learnt from uh, Graham Goldsworthy. Uh, he calls this biblical theology. I think the term biblical theology is a bit confusing because so many people use it. And uh, who wants an unbiblical theology? I mean, isn't, isn't all sound theology biblical theology? You know what I mean. The, the, the term uh, is, uh, it needs to be defined, and Graham does define it. Um, But I do want to warmly recommend Graham Goldsworthy's writings to you um, as what I believe to be the most straightforward and helpful guide that I know to learning to see the parts of the Bible in the light of the whole, that is, in the light of Jesus and his gospel. Um, If you haven't read uh, Graham's first book, it's a little volume. Um, It is simply brilliant. Uh, I don't know how many people I've met who've uh, read, it's called Gospel and Kingdom. Graham Goldsworthy, that's G-R-A-E-M-E, Goldsworthy. I won't spell that to you. Uh, But Gospel and Kingdom, uh, it is simply brilliant. And uh, folk that I've met uh, over the years, so many have just said they've read that book. And and it's helped them just to see how the Bible hangs together. Um, Very, very helpful indeed. He's got a number of others. I think that you can only get Gospel and Kingdom not as a separate volume now, but in a a little combination that the publishers have put together called the Goldsworthy Trilogy, which is a strange thing to do, isn't it? But the Goldsworthy, where you get three books in one, um, and Gospel and Kingdom is in that. But if you haven't read that, uh, or um, one of the, uh, the book where he expands on that a little is called According to Plan, um, if you haven't got into Goldsworthy and you're, you, you're wanting some help with this, that I think you must do. Um, and I do urge you to get hold of that. And uh, you won't find it a difficult read, uh, but I think it, uh, it, it's uh, one of those little books that is, uh, I think, transforming for a Bible teacher. All right, I, friends, I want to finish up with a comment on a step four. My step four is... Consider now what your sermon is supposed to do. And I suppose the question is, why do I and those who will hear this sermon need to hear this Old Testament story? In what ways do we not believe what this story will help us to see?
Uh, I think this is a very important stage in preparation. The most difficult thing I've found in preparing to come to be with you is that I don't know you. I don't understand this country. Who does? <laughs> but the Bible, you see, the Bible needs to be taught by pastors to the congregations they know and pastor. And that must never be supplanted. It's one of the concerns many of us have these days about the same array of stuff that's available. And of course, to a great deal of profit, and I'm not in any way denigrating it, but all the other resources available to Christian people must be secondary to the regular exposition of scripture by pastors to their congregations. So the question is, in what ways does my congregation need to hear 2 Kings chapter 1? I want to give serious thought to that. And the answer to that question will be very close to the answer to this question. In what ways do I need to hear 2 Kings chapter 1? And my own reflection on that question, uh, again, not knowing you, but at least knowing a little bit about myself, was that I and the people I know are deeply confused about the state of the world. I came to the rather surprising conclusion that Two Kings is a book that we need to hear. We are intimidated by the world around us. We don't know how to think about it. The culture wars are driving us crazy. I mean, they're driving me crazy. The poisonous politics is, 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 it just drives you to despair. The anxiety about the war. I don't know whether this is right, but I, I heard that the uh, Russians are going into that steel factory in uh, Ukraine where there are 200 or more civilians today. How do we think about this? How do we look at our, how do we understand our world? How do, how do we see our world? Our world which has come up with a, a crazy, twisted, corrupted moral framework from which, this is a new, I'm an old guy, okay? And I, I, I'm not used to this because I grew up when people would look at Christians and think that they were just sort of self-righteous people. They were goody goodies. They were too good. Not now. The moral framework that, is, that has invaded our society that has been built out of this twisted, looks on the Christians as evil. And our young people are growing up in schools where, and, and contexts where Christian faith is seen as an evil thing. Not just an irrelevant thing, not just an untrue thing, but a force for bad. That's confusing. How do we understand this world? How do we... <laughs> 2 Kings chapter 1 doesn't give us answers to all those questions, but it gives us ground to stand on. And as I hear Ahaziah's story, I need to see that my world is in the same kind of trouble as Israel was, and for the same reason. They have become the same kind of fools. And if I can see it clearly through the lens of Scripture. If Scripture can help me to see my world with clarity, I will see, you know, this isn't going to be solved with politics. This isn't going to be solved with a movement. This isn't going to be solved with arguments. This isn't going to be solved with slogans. The world needs a saviour. And I think I'm ready to start putting together my sermon. Let's pray. Dear God and Heavenly Father, again we commit ourselves to you as we, in various ways and in various contexts, give ourselves to the task of teaching the Scriptures. <clears throat> we pray that you'd help us to be faithful. And we pray that you'd help us to be people who find the road to Christ whenever we open the Scriptures. And we pray that we'd be people who can lead others along that road to the Saviour. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This message was brought to you from Truth For Life, where the learning is for living. To learn more about Truth For Life with Alistair Begg, visit us online 
at truthforlife.org.